الله رب العالمين وبه نستعين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته Thank you for joining us for the second session on religion and uh, morality. If at any point during the um, presentation today you're not able to hear my voice, please do let me know immediately by typing in the chat um, window um, so that we can try and fix that. Also at any point during our conversation, if you do have a question, please do feel free to pose that question. Um, it always leads to greater understandings and also leads to um, uh, good conversations as well. Um, we are going to begin by um, <clears throat> reviewing the material um, from last week and we'll do a summary of week one. Uh, having done that, I do then want to look at the difference between akhlaq and ahkam because today we are going to be exploring um, you know, the scope of ahkam and the scope of akhlaq and one of the questions that we want to look at today is, you know, number one, when we talk about moral growth, um, what are we talking about exactly when it comes to the idea of moral growth? Um, and secondly, especially for the believers whose um, actions in life are already defined by the ahkam of Islam, then what role does akhlaq play in their lives? if all of their actions are already defined by the ahkam of Islam. One of the questions that often comes up for the believers is, what do my personal values and my own conscience, what role does it have to play in my life if everything has been predefined um, by the ahkam of Islam? Um, using that, we're going to look at the whole question or issue of religion and moral growth and today we want to look at the role of religion in the moral growth of a human being and we also want to explore a little bit of what moral growth means um, and inshallah when we go through that conversation you'll see why that is a very important conversation to have <clears throat> we're going to look at five areas of moral growth um, the first one being removing negative characteristics and then replacing them with positive characteristics. Secondly, developing sublime character traits. Um, in Arabic, these are known as makarim al-akhlaq, as opposed to mahasin al-akhlaq. And inshallah, we'll be defining both those terms and looking at some examples. Um, then we'll look at developing a higher purpose um, for our moral actions. What's a good reason to be a moral person? Um, fourthly, we'll also look at an idea that we looked at last week, transforming our behavior into our character, um, because what is going to come with us into the hereafter um, is character. What is going to stay behind in this world um, is our behavior. Um, and then finally, you know, um, the main area that we want to focus on today is this whole idea of human moral agency. You know, we said last week, if you remember, that human beings do have the ability to understand right from wrong. Um, God has given us that ability. Uh, but how do we understand what is right from wrong? And secondly, you know, our understanding, where can we apply it? And where can we use it? if everything has already been defined by the ahkam of Islam, right? So if Islam has already told me what is wajib and what is haram, what is good to do, what is not good to do, then what about my own understanding and my own conscience? Where am I supposed to use that? Um, and inshallah, we'll look at that and then we'll end with a, a conclusion or a summary of what was said uh, today. So before um, we go into the summary of week one, um, if I can ask you, and I'm just looking for a little bit of um, uh, feedback and also a little bit of just conversation to get uh, our class started today. If you can just mention some points that stood out for you from our session last week or something that you learned that was new for you, 
um, or something that you remember from last week's session. <clears throat> Anything you found to be new or interesting? Okay, well, here is a summary of, uh, uh, of what we covered last week. Uh, the main question that we looked at last week is, do we need religion for morality? And if you remember, um, I say that whenever we talk about religion, I do like to break it down into two aspects of religion. The first are the ethics and the theology. Um, and the second is the scripture being the Quran, or in the case of Christianity, the Bible, or in the case of Judaism, the Torah. And we broke it down into two questions. One, do we need God or belief in God? Um, to be more, more, more uh, uh, particular, do we need belief in God for morality? Um, can a person be a moral person even if they don't have uh, belief in God? Um, and two, do we need scripture um, for morality. So are we able to understand good from evil even before the Quran comes to us? Or can we only understand good from evil after the Quran comes to us or after a divine book comes to us? And we took away two or three important conclusions. Firstly, we say that a person can have good morals, some good morals, even if he does not believe in God, right? And we saw many examples of people who came before the Prophet of Allah. They were polytheists, or maybe some of them were not even strong in their faith, um, but they had some good morals. A person came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, during the period of Jahiliya, um, I used to go and rescue the young girls who were going to be buried alive. And sometimes I would give some of my best camels to be able to rescue them and I would take care of them. And sometimes their parents would come back to me and they would say that we want our daughter now. Um, you know, we would like to have her in our family. And I'd return that daughter to that family. Um, oh, prophet of God, do I get ajr for what I did when I wasn't a Muslim? And the prophet of Allah said, yes, indeed, you will get ajr um, and thawab for what you did. The story shows that even if a person doesn't believe in all of the right beliefs, um, they can still have some good morals. <clears throat> However, the belief in God or the belief in the hereafter or the belief in the prophets of God or the belief in the attributes of God, it helps us in developing morality. <clears throat> and if you remember last week, we say there's a difference between knowing morality and committing ourselves to be moral. The belief in God helps us to commit ourselves Secondly, we say that human beings do have the ability to know good and evil, right and wrong. Um, we say that just as we're able to understand the usul of our deen, we're also able to rationally understand the akhlaq of our deen. So then the question obviously is, what is the role of the Quran um, and what's the role of scripture in teaching good and evil? And we say that firstly, the Quran um, tells us that it's a reminder. So it's reminding us of the good and evil that we may have forgotten. The first Imam has a very beautiful statement in Nahjul Balagha. He says that the Prophet came so that he may unearth for them those things which were hidden um, or which were buried in their intellects. So sometimes owing to the circumstances of the life in this world, we do become oblivious of our moral duties. The Quran says, I am a dhikr, I am a reminder of those moral duties. And secondly, it urges us um, to go through moral growth. And that's something that, inshallah, 
we're going to be talking about today. So to get the next uh, slide started, um, we want to look at the difference between ahkam, the laws of the faith, and akhlaq, the ethics of the faith. Um, and maybe you can help me out with this. What is the difference between ahkam and akhlaq? Or what are the differences between the laws and the ethics of the faith? If somebody were to ask you, what is ahkam and what does it define and what is akhlaq and what does akhlaq define? How would you respond to that? Let's start with the ahkam. What, what are the ahkam of the faith? <coughs> I know the ahkam of the faith are the, the laws of the faith, um, but you know, I'm looking for something more than the, um, the, the verbal translation or the literal translation. Um, you know, what does ahkam define for us? Or even give me some examples of the ahkam of the faith. Ahsan, thank you. One example is Salat. Ahkam is the code and Akhlaq is the practice. Uh, yes, Ahkam defines, you know, are the code of uh, actions for us. Um, and uh, sometimes it defines the um, acts of worship for us, as Sister Kanwal pointed out, Salat. Um, and sometimes it defines the code of interaction for us. Um, for example, um, when it comes to business transactions or when it comes to marriage um, or when it comes to other types of transactions or interactions that we have. Um, so thank you for those um, responses. Let's look at the next slide. Um, Ahkam is something that we know we must follow, but akhlaq is a manner, and are we able to abide by the laws that are um, expected from us? Asan, so there is um, you know, an aspect of, of uh, good mannerism um, and being in a particular manner as well when it comes to akhlaq um, and developing a particular character when it comes to akhlaq. But ahkam is something that we do, um, something that we follow. Um, so I'm just going to take those answers and maybe just define them a little more. Um, let's look at the slide together. The ahkam of Islam, they defined human actions and states. So ahkam are things we do, right? Ahkam are things that define our actions. And therefore you'll see, they will say an action is wajib or an action is haram or an action is mubah. It generally defines our actions. These actions may be acts of worship, like prayer and fasting and hajj. And sometimes these actions, so these are known as ibadat, and sometimes these actions are human interactions, alaykum as um, <clears throat> uh, And they are known as mu'amalat. Um, and an example of that is trade, an example is marriage, even eating and clothing, because that's part of human behavior, which is not an act of worship, um, you know, then that uh, is also considered as part of mu'amalat. Um, Islam defines that, ahkam defines that. There are other things that ahkam also define which are not directly related to our actions. For example, the ahkam will say something is tahir or something is najis. Someone is married or someone is not uh, married. Uh, something is ghasbi or something is not ghasbi. It gives things or people their states. But the only reason why that's important is because there are laws that follow from it. So if something is najis, 
then we cannot, um, you know, for example, pray with it or say our prayers um, with it. In any case, ahkam defines actions, um, something to do. As far as akhlaq is concerned, if you remember the definition from last week, um, our scholars say that akhlaq is a character of the soul, a character that has become stable within the soul. And if you remember, they say that it becomes so stable that you don't even have to think about it before acting upon it, right? And the example that we gave was to say that when generosity is not a part of your character, you have to think and convince yourself that you should perform an act of generosity, correct? Um, so sometimes when they're making announcements, they will have to say to you that if you do this act of generosity, Allah will give you Jannah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you many folds in this world. We will mention your name, we'll put your name on a brick, um, we will give you a tax receipt, and after a lot of convincing, sometimes a person will do an act of generosity. <coughs> <coughs> However, that is not akhlaq. Akhlaq is when that character has become stable in your soul, that it encourages you to act upon it without even having to think about it. Okay, And these um, characteristics may be positive character traits, for example, humbleness and compassion, or they may be negative character traits like prejudice, right, asabiyya, like arrogance, kibra, like jealousy, um, hasad. It's important for us to understand that there is an aspect of ahkam that deals with our actions, and akhlaq defines the states of our soul and how our character should be. Right? Many a times we don't make that distinction. And because we don't make that distinction, we don't realize that there is a higher level of being. Let's look at this particular um, you know, uh, uh, verse of the Quran that I have on this uh, page. It's a very famous verse and many of you know this verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ And I have not created the jinn and human beings except to do my um, ibadah. Uh, let me ask you, in this particular verse, what do you understand from the word ibadah? لِيَعْبُدُونَ To do my ibadah. If you had to explain that, how would you explain it? Give me some examples of what God means over here when he says that I have not created the jinns, the jinn, wal ins, illa, except liya'budun, they should do my ibadah. Okay, one ibadah in this verse meaning means to follow the laws of Allah, um, and yes, it does mean to follow the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, and to be in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, ensuring that you perform uh, the ahkam of Islam, that you pray and, and you fast and you go for hajj. Is there any other meaning to ibadah over here? Besides prayer and fasting and hajj and making sure we do what is halal and we stay away from that which is haram, is there any other meaning? Is there any other instance of ibadah that you can take from this verse? Okay, yes. Um, <clears throat> you know, having, acting with a good character. Um, so, you know, uh, one could say giving charity, um, forgiving others when they do wrong to you, um, speaking the truth. Um, perhaps uh, you could say that maintaining people's trust. Yes. 
So all of these ways of defining this particular verse um, are from a very ahkami perspective, right? We look at ibadah, and the first thing that we think of is actions. Um, ahsantum, thank you. Submission, ibadah, coming from abd, right? So um, we look at it from a very ahkam perspective, and we only think of action and action and action. So I've not created the jinn and the human beings except to do the action of worshipping me. And then we sort of, you know, uh, 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 define the scope of actions and we try to open it up. And we say that it's not only prayers and fasting and hajj that is there, but it's also acts of charity. It's also acts of kindness and acts of sadaqa as well. Even that is a form of ibadah. However, as you know, you've pointed out over here, we can also look at this verse from an akhlaq perspective, that we're not just looking at actions, but now we're looking at the state of the soul, right? And we're saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in this verse, I have not created the jinn and the human beings except to become my abd, right? To become submissive, to have a heart or a soul that is submissive to me, a heart or a soul that is pleased with what I have destined for it, right? And I think that that's more important over here. And that's why I have said that the purpose of the ahkam is to actually develop the akhlaq and what God wants from us and the purpose of our creation is not the ahkam itself, but the purpose of the creation is the akhlaq. So I'll leave you with one verse of the Quran. You may want to write this down. It's not on the slide. But Allah says in the Quran, وَأَحْسِنُوا and do good, right? It comes from the word ihsan. Ihsan meaning to do those things which are beautiful, those things which are good. وَأَحْسِنُوا Why? Right? God doesn't say because God likes good actions, because the goal is not the good actions. وَأَحْسِنُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Surely God loves those people who do good, meaning those who have a character of doing goodness, do so much good, do it so repetitively until it becomes a part of your character, a part of your soul. Okay. So moving on, um, you know, we talk about religion and morality. Um, we notice that human beings do have a potential for moral growth. Every being that God has created has a particular potential. You take an apple seed, for example, it has a particular potential. Um, an apple seed has the potential of becoming an apple tree and giving fruits and giving an apple. Um, when that apple seed becomes an apple tree and it gives fruit, we say that that particular seed has reached its kamal, it has reached its perfection. An animal also has a particular potential. His potential is to be able to grow, to be able to um, reproduce and take care of its children, for example. When an animal that comes into this world goes through that process, finally reproduces and you know nurtures its children, we say that that animal has reached its perfection. Well, what about a human being? What potential does a human being have? And when does a human being reach his potential, right? Um, so one of the most important potentials that a human being has is the potential for uh, moral growth, okay? And the Prophet of Allah says in this hadith, Innama bu'ithtu. Innama in the Arabic language is for exclusivity. The only reason that I was sent, the only purpose for which God sent me, li'utammima makarim al-akhlaq, li'utammima to complete. It comes from the word tamam, itmam. Itmam meaning to complete. Now you only complete something that is a process. And since human moral morality is a, a process of growth the prophet of allah said i have come to complete makarim al akhlaq the most noble of character traits even when we look at the um, dua of imam al sajjad he has a dua in the sahifa known as the dua of makarim al akhlaq in that particular dua there is a line in there where the imam says 
And Shaheed Mutahari says that the dua is called Karim al Akhlaq because of that particular line, perhaps. In that dua, the Imam says, Wahabli, and O oh Allah, grant me or bless me, Wahabli, Ma'ali al Akhlaq. Ma'ali coming from Ulu. Ulu meaning something that's sublime, something that is high. And O oh Lord, bless me or grant me with the most sublime of character traits. So human beings are capable of moral growth. And the point that we would like to drive today is to say that the role of religion is to actually nurture that moral growth within a human being. Now, I think we have to begin by appreciating that morality is not so simple, okay? or moral growth is not a very simple idea. Um, I remember once traveling um, to another city, <clears throat> and I came across a person over there at the Islamic Center, and we were speaking about morality and moral growth. And this person said to me that I have a very simple formula for morality. I don't understand much of what you preach and um, the verses that you quote, uh, but I have a very simple formula that I try to abide by that formula. And as long as I'm able to do that, I think of myself as a moral person. And he said that my formula is that, you know, despite all the work that I do and the interactions that I have, at night when I go to sleep, if I can sleep with a clean conscience, then I think of my day to be a moral day and I think of myself to be a moral person. But if I cannot get sleep at night, my conscience bites at me then I know that I have not been moral on that day. Now, on one hand, that's commendable because this person is referring to their conscience um, and asking themselves, you know, what I did today, was that commendable or not? And we're going to see a hadith from the Holy Prophet where he advises us to do that. But on the other hand, you know, it would be very hard to think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us and put us on the face of this earth to do whatever we want to do as long as at night we're able to get a good night's sleep. I don't think that morality is limited to that. There is more to moral growth potential than just getting a night's sleep. Secondly, when you study Western uh, uh, morals and morality, um, whenever they talk about about the philosophy of morality, um, one thing you'll always notice is that their focus is on the actions. How do I ensure that my actions are moral actions? Um, the things that I do um, are moral, and the things that I don't do also, I don't do because they are immoral. The focus is very much on understanding which actions are moral and which actions are not moral. We just said right now that the focus in akhlaq in Islam is not on the actions per se, but rather in developing or perfecting our heart, perfecting our soul, developing good traits within our soul. And some of that is coming back in Western morality. So if you have some time later on, you can actually go online and type in virtue ethics. Um, ethics that are supposed to lead to certain virtues within a human being. Exactly the idea that we've been talking about. Um, and you'll see that virtue ethics is making a, a revival uh, even in um, Western circles. Okay. So what I want to do in the next few slides is look at um, areas of moral growth um, where religion helps us with that particular growth. Um, any questions so far from the conversations that we've had? <coughs> it is a lot of material. It is a little bit of different material. Um, do feel free to ask questions. No, no question is asked. Um, and if you want further clarifications, even if it is tangential, um, you know, do feel free to ask. 
So here are five areas of moral growth that all of us need to work on in order to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to fulfill our potential. The journey of morality um, begins by first removing negative moral traits and then replacing them with positive moral traits. The negative moral traits are called radha'il. Radha'il is the plural of radhila. Radhila is something which is lowly. And the opposite of it is fadha'il. And fadha'il is the plural of fadila. And fadila is something that is of merit. Okay. Many of our scholars in the classical texts, for example, if you pick up Mi'raj al-Sa'ada uh, of Mullah Naraqi, you will see that he begins first by talking about the radha'il and how to remove them. And then he talks about the fadha'il. Or what you can do today is um, go online, find Imam Khomeini's 40 hadith, and you will see that the first few are radha'il, a negative moral traits, and then the next few that he talks about are fadha'il, positive moral traits. So the journey of morality does not begin by developing good and positive character traits. Of course, we do that but rather by making sure that we don't have the negative character traits, right? Um, so negative character traits like jealousy, like envy. Um, I guess envy can sometimes be something positive um, if we used productively. Anger, um, pessimism. Fadha'il are positive character traits that are things that we want to adopt, um, like humbleness, like generosity, like the character of, of, of being able to sacrifice and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. The scholars say that the, the process of tazkiyah or the akhlaq of Islam teaches us the act of removing negative mm -hmm. character traits before we adorn the soul with positive character traits. For example, when somebody wants to clean their body, um, what do they do first? They first will remove the dirt from their body, take a shower, and then they adorn themselves with perfume or, for example, makeup or good clothes. When you do your wudu, you first are told to remove the najasat, and then you can pour water, which is pure, and adorn yourself with the wudu. So just the way the body first needs to be cleaned of dirt, and then you can put perfume on it. Just the way your wudu first requires you to remove najasa before you can put water. In the same way with the soul, you first have to remove the negative character traits before you develop the positive character traits. And you will see that throughout Islam. For example, the most important statement of Islam is La ilaha illallah. La ilaha. First remove all the negative uh, or the wrong beliefs that you had. You believed in so-and-so to be important by themselves, so-and-so to, uh, um, to, to be effective by themselves. You're removing all of that, and then you say, Illallah, except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one thing I do want to point out is that in this moral growth, and religion shows us how to remove the negative traits and how to develop the positive traits, the act of tazkiyah is a continuous process. I think sometimes when we think about this, we say that once I've removed all the negative character traits, then I don't have to worry about them. I only work on the positive character traits. And that's not exactly how it works. At every moment, a person is self-assessing and asking themselves that, do I have negative moral traits hidden within me? And do I need to work on it? The example that our scholars give, they say that, you know, sometimes um, because we've not been tested, because we've not gone through hardship, some of the negative moral traits, they actually, if you think of a swimming pool, and let's say you throw some sand on the swimming pool, what happens to the sand on the swimming pool? Um, if the water is calm, as in your life is calm, the sand is going to fall to the bottom of the pool. And looking at it from the outside, the way we look at our souls from the outside, 
you will not be able to see the dirt or the sand at the bottom of the pool, right? But then sometimes in life, you are tested. It's as if somebody has thrown a big rock or a big item into that pool and it mixes the water. And if you have negative character traits hidden deep within you, within that swimming pool of yours, it's going to come up at that time. And therefore you find sometimes when we go through hardship in life, those you know negative character traits, they somehow appear out of nowhere. <clears throat> And the Qur'an gives us an example of that. And the example of that is Bal'am, right? Who was mustajabu da'wat, whose du'as were answered whenever he would make du'a. Um, but then he had a love for this world hidden deep within him. And when Fir'aun promised him something in return for praying against Prophet Musa or taking an action against Prophet Musa, you know, when he was tested with the love of this world, those negative character traits came out. The same goes with the example of Umar ibn Sa'd. So the point that uh, we're making over there is that the act of Tazkiyah is a continuous process until the end of life. That's one area of, of moral growth. <clears throat> the second area of moral growth and an area where religion helps human beings in their moral growth is developing not just normal character or good character, but developing the most sublime character. Now, <clears throat> there's two terms that we find in our ahadith. The first term is mahasin al-akhlaq. Mahasin coming from the word husn. Husn is generally translated as good, but in Arabic, something that's beautiful or something that has a good appearance um, is called, um, you know, uh, husn, right? So, for example, the hadith of the Prophet, he says, Allahumma fakama ahsanta khalqi fa ahsan khulqi. Oh Allah, the way you have adorned my uh, physique, I ask you to adorn or beautify my character as well. Mahasan al akhlaq are good character traits. For example, being charitable, being hospitable, being compassionate. Right? So, I have a hadith for you over there. The narrator says, what is ma haddu husnul khulq? What is the definition of having good character? And when the narrator asked this hadith or this question um, of the imam, the imam said to him, and I'm going to read the Arabic for you. He said, talinu janibak. You know, good character means to be kind in your behavior that whenever you're talking to people or you are interacting with them you interact with kindness with softness and then the imam says kalamak," and your speech is a good speech it is a pure speech it's not rash it's not harsh it is a soft speech and you meet your brother with a smiling face with a good face with uh, a happy demeanor, um, and you know, you bring happiness into him. Then we've got a second um, uh, uh, term in our akhlaq called makarim al akhlaq. Makarim coming from karam, karama, meaning dignified, honorable. Makarim al akhlaq, the most noble of character traits. What's the difference between mahasin al akhlaq? and makarim al-akhlaq. The Prophet of Allah says, I was sent for makarim al-akhlaq. Or for example, he says in another hadith, alaykum bi makarim al-akhlaq. You know, commit yourself not to mahasin, but to makarim, the most noble of character traits, because I was sent with them. Okay? So in the next slide, you're going to see a hadith. I want you to look at that hadith. Just note, what is Mahasan al-Akhlaq from this slide? And when we go to the next slide, I'll ask you what's the difference between Makarim al-Akhlaq and Mahasan al-Akhlaq? So again, somebody asked Imam al-Sadiq alayhi afdal salati wa salam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad to define Makarim al-Akhlaq. He alayhi salam said that Makarim al-Akhlaq is that Al-Afu amman zalamak to forgive the one who has oppressed you, the one who has wronged you. 
وَصِلَتُ مَنْ قَطَعَكْ To make relationships But with the one who has cut off from you The one who doesn't want to have a relationship with you وَإِعْطَاءُ مَنْ حَرَمَكْ And to give But not to everybody To give to the one who has deprived you وَقَوْلُ الْحَقِّ And to speak the truth وَلَوْ عَلَى نَفْسِكْ Even if it is against yourself and even if it is against your own interests. Okay. So if I were to ask you then, what's the difference between mahasin and makarim? What are some differences that you have noticed? Even, even if they are one word answers, um, the difference between makar, what you see on the screen right now, and mahasin. Remember, the Imam had said mahasin um, was to uh, be kind in your interaction, pure in your speech, and meet your brother with a smiling face. Just put it up on the chat for you to be able to see these two side by side. You can just point out some of the differences that you see between them. Makarib is definitely going a step forward. Um, you know, it demands more than mahasin al akhlaq. In what ways is it going a step forward? Okay. Somebody has said that selflessness is makarim, right? Um, and, and selflessness is required in makarim al-akhlaq. Um, you know, to do good to anybody, um, that's mahasin al-akhlaq. But to forgive the one who has wronged you, uh, you know, selflessness, you know, it requires you to do something um, not for that person or for yourself, but to do something for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, and to do it because God wants you to do it. So selflessness is makarim, yes. What other differences do you see? So makarim is fighting the instinct for the better. Um, I, I, you know, we could use the word instinct um, or we could use the word some of our uh, lowly desires um, as well. So for example, speaking the truth, um, you know, that's mahasnul akhlaq, but when it is against your own interests, when it is against you, um, you know, then you have to go, as you've said, against your instinct or some of your lowly desires. You do have to put a lot of faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whoever speaks the truth, God is going to protect him. Um, and, uh, and, and you have to act according to that. So yes, makarim is fighting the instinct for the better. Makarim is harder and more difficult to do. Uh, makarim requires us to step on our ego and to step on our selfishness and makarim also requires us to make some of these characteristics um, a part of our character because otherwise it's very difficult to to achieve um, another area 
where religion helps us with moral growth is it uh, provides us with a higher purpose for moral growth. And I'm just going to quickly go over this slide. Um, this slide itself um, can take a lot of time to talk about. And I think that just understanding a little bit of this slide will help you to answer uh, many of your questions. Some of you will have noticed that the Quran, whenever it tells us to do good or to stay away from bad, um, it talks quite often about Jannah and Jahannam. And somebody had asked me once that morality in Islam, is it driven by the fear of hellfire and the love for paradise? How come the Quran talks so much about it? And, um, you know, I had to point out to them that there were levels of intention uh, mentioned in the Quran um, and that if we want to develop ourselves morally, um, we have to move from one level of intention to another level of um, intention. So when you look at the verses of the Quran, there are three motivations generally given in the Quran. The first motivation is acting for the sake of paradise or fear from hellfire and acting morally for that particular um, reason. And this is necessary for some people. Um, you know, uh, sometimes there are some uh, individuals who have said that if it wasn't for the fire of hell and the fear that we have for the fire of hell, we would not have stayed away from committing certain sins. And sometimes a human being is in that level where um, the only thing that can hold them back um, is the fear of the fire of hell or the desire for Jannah. So that's one level of uh, intention. The second level of intention that Islam expects from us is acting morally because it befits the status of a human being, right? Um, it befits uh, uh, the human soul. If you remember a hadith from last week, we say that the first Imam had said that if it wasn't for, even if there was no Jannah or Jahannam and there was no reward or punishment, it still yambari, right? It still befits us to develop makarim al akhlaq. Why? Because it leads to the path of salvation. That's a hadith from the first Imam, right? He's trying to say in this hadith, well, it befits the human being and the human soul, and that acting in a particular manner is not befitting of the human soul. You know, sometimes you act in a particular manner because you're ashamed of what people will say. Pay attention to this. Sometimes you act in a particular manner not because you're ashamed of people, but you're ashamed of yourself because you know that's not befitting of you. You know, that's not befitting of your esteem, right? And one of the things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does in the Quran is he reminds us of who we are. And having that sense of identity that the Qur'an gives us is very important. You may wonder sometimes, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeatedly tell us in the Qur'an the story of Adam? Because he wants to build that identity within us, that you are the Khalifa of Allah on this earth. When you think of yourself as the Khalifa of Allah, does it befit you to do these actions? Does it befit you to do those actions, right? Or Allah says in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمَ We have honored the children of Adam. Meaning you have karama, right? And from this, um, you know, another point that we can take away is that even when we're dealing with our children, let's never take away their self-esteem. Let's never take away um, their honor and their dignity from them in the way we speak to them, right? Because that is the one more, most important thing that's going to hold them um, in the path of Islam and that's going to help them be a moral person. And then thirdly, acting morally for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you see the Quran also drives, tries to drive this aspect of morality. In Allah yuhibbu tawwabin, you know, do tawbah, why? Because God loves those who do tawbah for the love of Allah. وَيُحِبُّ الْمُتَطَهِّرِينَ And God loves those who purify themselves. 
meaning develop themselves morally. وَأَحْسِنُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Right? God surely loves those who do good. Or God is sorry with those who, who do good. Right? And we have a hadith from the first imam over here um, where he says, وَعْبَدْتُكَ لِأَنَّكَ أَحْلُ الْعِبَادَ Right? I worship you or I became your abd because you are worthy of devotion. I'm going to quickly move on from this slide because there's a couple more slides that I'd like to cover before um, the end of today's uh, session. Another area of moral growth where religion plays a role in motivating us um, is developing moral character. Now, we did look at this concept last week, but I, I do want to add to it. And that's one thing that I would like us to be uh, conscious of. Um, sometimes we do get complacent. In our complacency, we think of ourselves as good people because we're doing good things. There's a difference between doing good things and being a good person. Um, many of us, we do good things. Are we a good person or not? That's an entirely different story. Yeah? So there's something called behavior and there's something called character. Behavior are the actions which are visible to others. People are able to see our behavior. You know, they're able to see our actions. So what do people see? People see us giving charity. People see us praying. People see us speaking truthfully, right? And we are able to control our behavior because human beings have control over their actions, okay? Character is a state of the soul which is not visible to others, right? People don't see whether we are a charitable person or not, whether we are selfish or not, whether we are humble or we are arrogant, okay? Two things are important. One, people don't see our character. But as I pointed out last week, we've come to realize that people judge our character on the basis of our behavior. So we behave in public in a particular manner so that people think that we have a particular character. Okay? And sometimes when we behave consistently, we even start thinking that we have that particular character as well until we're tested. <clears throat> Second thing is that, and this is important to realize, you can control your behavior. You cannot control your character necessarily. Okay? The mind can force a particular behavior. The mind cannot force a particular character. Character is something you mold, it's something you shape. The way uh, an artisan will take, for example, his hammer and his chisel and he'll start shaping a stone or a potter will start shaping the clay, um, that's how you shape your character. You don't do it overnight, you don't do it with a lot of hard actions, but you do it with soft and consistent um, behavior, right? Now, there are ways of finding out, you know, if something is just a part of your behavior or it's a part of your character. Remember that when you go into the hereafter, you're taking your character with you, not your behavior with you. Okay. So you do want to make sure that all the good behavior that you have has also become a part of your soul and a part of your character. In, in simple words, it has become second nature to you. So look at this hadith that's there on the screen. It says that the signs of a believer are five. And I'd like to read of the hadith for you. Alamatul mu'min khamsun. Now there is a famous hadith, signs of a believer are five, that most of you would know about from the 11th holy imam. Um, and that's the hadith that talks about Ziyaratul Arba'een, um, wearing a ring on the right hand, reciting 50 or 51 rak'as of prayer every day, uh, saying Bismillah uh, loudly, 
um, you know, uh, these are some of the signs of a believer, it says. Hmm? This one also begins in the same way. Alamatul mu'min khams. The signs of a believer are five. And I wish we would pay attention to this hadith just as much as we pay to that one. This particular hadith is from the sixth imam. Here's what the imam says. Here are the signs of a mu'min. Right? This is where you know whether something is a part of your behavior or a part of your character. Having taqwa. Not just taqwa, but a high level of taqwa. Not in public, but in private. We put on our behavior when we are in public. We take it off the way we take off our clothes when we are in private. And then privately, it's our character that shows, right? For example, ask yourself, my demeanor outside and in my home, is it the same or not? Sometimes our demeanor outside is a very kind and affectionate demeanor. Inside the home, it's not kind and affectionate, right? Outside is our behavior. Inside is our character. Two, was sadaqa fil qilla, to give sadaqa. But to give sadaqa when you have very little yourself. When you have to sacrifice, you have to do ithar, right? You know, if your behavior is a behavior of giving charity, you'll normally give charity when you have money. But when you don't have money, um, you know, then character kicks in and it says, no, I need to hold something for myself, right? But if a person has a, 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 a character of charity, yes, whether he has a lot or he has a little, his character motivates him to give charity. So charity in poverty. And to have patience in hardship and difficulty. To be forbearing when you are angered, right? Um, so anger is a natural response that human beings have, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And those not God doesn't say those who don't get angry, but those who are able to subdue their anger. Now, if forbearance is just a part of my behavior, I'm able to forbear in normal circumstances. But once I'm angry, once I'm put under stress, under pressure, one way of knowing your character, you respond under stress. How you respond under pressure. People are not normally able to put on a behavior behavior under stress and pressure. So if something is not a part of their character, when they're put under stress, they break down. Yeah, That behavior breaks down. So the Imam says over here, well, if you're able to forbear when you're under stress, a stress like anger, right, that's a sign of a believer. Meaning now, hell, forbearance is a part of your character. Or the Imam says, and speaking truthfulness in Fear, okay, so another area of moral development that religion can help us in that area is developing not just moral behavior, but developing moral character. Again, we've gone through a lot of material. I'm just going to take a, 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 a break or a pause over here to see if any questions uh, before we go to our last slide. Okay. Then we move on to the last slide or the last few slides now. So I'd like to speak about moral agency over here. Um, to, 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 to kind of invigorate the discussion on this particular slide, and to help us understand why this is important, um, one day a young brother said that his friend, who was not a Muslim, said to him that whilst you do act in a way that is moral, 
you act in that way because your religion tells you to do that. So you are following your religion or an authority and acting in a way that is moral, right? Because somebody is telling you to do that, okay? Mm -hmm. However, when it comes to me, I also act, this is the non-Muslim saying that, I also act in a way that is moral, but first I think about it. And I look into my conscience and I decide what is right and what is wrong. I go through that struggle of understanding good from evil, right? And then I commit myself to that which I know to be good. So I take ownership um, of morality and I act then in a moral manner, right? Therefore, I act with moral agency. That can be said to be morality. So then the question that obviously comes up is, what is the role of our personal values, the conscience that Allah has given us, the aql that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in the life of a believer? When is he supposed to exercise it if everything has been defined by the ahkam of Islam? For everything is told to him, this is wajib, this is haram, this is mustahab, this is, for example, makru, right? Or, for example, the Quran tells him, these are good things, these are bad things, do that which is good and do that which is bad, right? This question becomes so important because just as, you know, there is a conflict between science and religion in modern days or a perceived conflict between science and religion in modern days, there's also a perceived conflict between morality and religion in modern days. And many secularists will tell you that morality, in fact, religion not only does not help morality, religion stymies and limits morality because it tells people that you don't need to think about good and evil. We're going to tell you what is good. We're going to tell you what is evil. And um, you just follow that. So rather than making a human being a moral person, it just makes him a very submissive person, right? So how are we going to respond to that, okay? Firstly, we say that a human being is a moral creature, okay? We said earlier that he has the potential of developing morality. He also has the potential of acting upon his morals. That is what distinguishes us from animals. Animals will act upon fear. Animals will act upon desire um, or need. Uh, animals normally don't act upon a set of principles or a set of morals that they understand to be good. Human beings are a moral creature, meaning that they can act upon a set of moral principles. Right? Then we say that a human being also has the ability to know right from wrong. Now, this is a conclusion that we took from last week's conversation. What we didn't look at last week is we say a human being has the ability to understand right from wrong. But how do you understand that which is right and that which is wrong? Okay. So, um, you know, scholars, Muslim and non-Muslim, have come up with a number of ways of determining tea. And all of this falls in a discussion called the philosophy of morality. Okay? Some people, for example, um, you know, in certain religions, they say, well, morality has to do with empathy. Morality has to do with your emotions. For example, when you see somebody who is suffering and your heart burns for them and you feel bad for them and you act upon it and you uplift them, you show compassion to them. Well, you know, that's how you come to know morality. You look into your heart um, and you see how you feel about that particular issue. Okay. Some have said, well, no, you don't look at emotions, but you look at your aql, you look at reasoning, um, and you see the consequences of that action. If the consequences are good consequences, it brings about goodness, or it brings about happiness, or it brings about overall uh, you know, soundness, then it's a good action. And if it doesn't, then it's a bad action. You have to use your aql, right? And you might have heard of this term called utilitarianism or consequentialism. 
It's one of the philosophies of morality. <clears throat> Some, however, have said that you have to look at your conscience, not your feelings, not just your reasoning, but rather your conscience, your wujdan, right? Your fitrah. And it seems that the Quran seems to agree with the last one over there. Look into your conscience. Right? Last week we looked at the verse where Allah says, فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا I'm driving to a particular point as we go through this conversation. So you want to stay with me um, in this. right? God has um, inspired every soul with that which is going to be harmful for it and that which is going to be good for it. And today I want you to look at another verse. It's from Surah Al-Anbiya, verse number 73. It's a segment of the verse. It's a very short segment, something you can memorize as well. And we revealed to them good actions. Right? The late Shayd Murtala Mutahari, he says in the tafsir of this verse, there's a very beautiful um, nuance. It says, notice God doesn't say, وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْهِمْ أَنِ فَعَلُوا الْخَيْرَاتِ And we reveal to them that do good actions. No, we reveal to them the good actions. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has inspired in the soul of every human being those actions which are good and those actions which are bad. And he just needs to look into his conscience to know good from bad, right? We also have an example from the seerah of the Holy Prophet. In the seerah of the Holy Prophet, we're told that when the verse of the Quran was revealed, help each other in doing birr. Birr is goodness. taqwa, right? And maintaining taqwa. وَلَا تَعَاوَنُ عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ And do not cooperate or help each other in doing uh, uh, sins, in committing sins, and in enmity. So prior to Islam, the thinking in Arabia was you must help your brother even if he is wrong, and you must stand against your enemy even if he is right. And Islam changed that, and it said, وَتَعَاوَنُ عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى Help each other in goodness, regardless of whether it's your friend or your enemy, right? And don't help each other in committing sins and in expressing enmity, you know, meaning even if that person is, is your friend. When this particular verse of the Quran was revealed, somebody came to the Holy Prophet and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I live far away from you. I'm not able to come into Medina every time that I can ask you what is good that I should do it and what is ism, what is, you know, uh, an act of sin that I should stay away from it. So, Ya Rasulullah, can you give me a list of things um, that, uh, that I can do and a list of things that I should stay away from? <clears throat> and the Prophet of Allah wanted to give him a general principle. So he said to him, Wasiba, oh Wasiba, Ya Wasiba, his name was Wasiba. Ya Wasiba, is yeah, you know when you go to your marja and you ask him a question, that's called istifta, right? You're asking him for a fatwa. The Prophet used the same expression. He says, istafti qalbak, ask your heart. Then he repeated, istafti qalbak, ask your heart. And he repeated again. He said, ask your heart. Another hadith, he said to him, look into your conscience, into your heart. If your heart is comfortable with something, then do it for it is good. And if your heart is hesitant about something, then stay away from it. That is, is bad. So human beings have the ability to understand good from evil. This ability has been put into them by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they, can, they only have to look into their own hearts, into their own souls, their own conscience to know good from evil, right? The role of religion, we said, is not to teach us all good and all evil. It does that. But the role of religion is to revive human conscience, right? It came to the people of Arabia and it said, what is wrong with your conscience? 
do we have to tell you not to bury your daughters alive? Doesn't your conscience tell you to do that? And urge him to act upon it. Now, so from this we take away that, you know, as you go through life, you're not always asking is something halal or haram or wajib or mustahab. But one of the things I hope we're also doing is looking into our conscience and asking ourselves, you know, what does our conscience say about this? That's how Islam wanted a mu'min or a Muslim to function, right? Not only by looking at the risala, which he has to, yes, but also by looking at his own conscience as well and giving value to it. So a question should come to your mind right now, and that is, well, if, if we have a and we're supposed to act upon it, then why do we have ahkam? And if we have ahkam, then why are you telling us to act upon our conscience? Okay. So at the next slide, I want to look at that. Okay. The ahkam, it's important to realize, they define the bound of faith. They say that if your conscience doesn't help you to act in the right way, then here are the boundaries of the faith, and we do not allow you to go beyond these boundaries. Okay? This does not, however, mean that as a human being, you want to live on the boundaries of the faith. Right? Um, you, you, you may want to live by a higher moral standard and not just by the boundaries of the faith. What do I mean by that? Let me just give you some examples. The Quran says, if you're not a person who likes to worship God and to thank him for all the good that he has done for you, well, the least we expect from you is that you're going to say the five daily prayers. Okay. Does it mean that we want to limit ourselves to the five daily prayers? No. Let's look into our relationships. The ahkam of Islam say that, look, if the husband and wife cannot agree to work with each other and have a relationship on the basis of higher morals, on the basis of trust and love and rahmah, compassion for each other, right? Then here are the boundaries that they cannot go beyond those boundaries. The husband has to provide for his wife, right? The wife also, there are certain things she has to provide for her husband. But these are the boundaries of the faith. I mean, you would agree that you don't want to live your relationship on, on the basis of rights, which are the boundaries of Islam. You know that a relationship like that does not grow, right? You want to live your relationship on the basis of trust and love each other that is what helps the relationship grow in the same way a human being does not only grow just by limiting himself to not doing that which is haram and only doing that which is wajib even though that's very important and sometimes that is by itself sufficient but you want to live your life on the basis of akhlaq on the basis of a uh, 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 higher moral values so one thing i want to be very clear about and understand Haram cannot be made halal. If your conscience is telling you to do that, then you need to go and look. Okay. So when we say look into your conscience, we're not asking or mubah. What do we mean by that? We mean that even if something is not wajib, okay, it doesn't mean that you don't want to make it wajib upon yourself. If you're important, a Muslim right? We may not have wajib in any way. The material, okay? But that doesn't mean that as a Muslim, or you don't want to make it haram upon yourself to say, for example, use styrofoam, because we know that styrofoam does not get decomposed even for thousands of years, right? When it comes to animal rights, yes, we may not, for example, have a, a certain ahkam that tell us it is wajib for us to, to help the animals that are going extinct, to make sure that, you know, when we buy meat or we buy fish, 
um, that, for example, when we have water bottles, because they do end up in the ocean, and when they end up in the ocean, they do create a huge miles and miles of water bottles are now um, in the ocean, and that's affecting the fish. Right? May not have uh, uh, one of our ahkam that using plastic water bottles is haram or haram, right? But this tells you have to do that you should stop doing that you can make it wajib upon yourself um, to actually do that you know Shaykh Mutahari he says that Ayati had passed away um, at the time when he was writing that book or he was... this person because one day he was driving he was so well, not just um, you know uh, uh, human life but all life even animal life that as he was driving a car a dog passed and he didn't want to he was so he tried to swerve oh. <clears throat> okay um, the the voice is getting cut off I'm just going to try and maybe move location to see if um, that provides you with uh, okay. I, I hope you're able to hear me better if you're talking if you're not able to hear me please do let me know um, yes so he tried to swerve and as he swerved away um, you know, his car went and hit a pole or it went into a ditch and he passed away um, um, because of that. Now, again, that was not an issue of, you know, um, halal and haram or wajib or not wajib, sorry. Um, you know, it was just his conscience wouldn't allow him to hit an animal um, and he acted upon it. And well, what he didn't anticipate is that um, he uh, passed away. Even if something is not haram, it doesn't mean that as a believer, you don't want to avoid it, right? Because haram gives us the boundary of Islam. Doesn't mean we have to just live on that edge, yes? Um, so for example, exploitation of human and uh, uh, natural resources in developing countries. You know, when you go right now and you buy uh, some cheap piece of electronic, I buy some cheap piece of electronic from Walmart, um, you're able to buy it for five to ten dollars, for example, um, or we're able to buy cheap shirts um, sometimes, um, or we're able to buy, um, you know, uh, goods basically in general, which are manufactured very, very cheaply, um, and, and they don't hold to a particular standard. Um, you know, many times when they're made in developing countries or third world countries, these electronics are made, number one, by taking the resources from those countries for dirt cheap prices. And secondly, they're also taken from those countries or they're made in those countries, um, you know, in, 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 for, for very, uh, uh, you know, uh, very cheap labor that almost sometimes is like slave labor, right? And sometimes when you get a cheap piece of electronics, and you ask yourself, you know, the price I've paid isn't the price of making this product. You know, who has paid the price for this product? Um, it's the developing countries. Their natural and human resources have paid the price for that product. Now, sometimes you may come across a product where you know that the company does not have high ethical standards in how it treats its workers, um, you know, in different parts of the world, in China or Bangladesh or Africa. Uh, maybe there isn't a fatwa that says it is haram to um, buy that particular product where you're sure that it's, you know, people are being exploited. Um, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't listen to your conscience and make it haram upon yourself. Maybe you don't need haram, but, you know, avoid buying that product, for example, because you've listened to your conscience. Okay, are there any questions at this time um, before we go into the conclusion? Um,
Um, so, I mean, the examples will come up. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, in, in your day-to-day -day, uh, uh, lives, um, you know, um, uh, not recycling, for example, I don't think, you know, it says it's haram uh, to throw recyclable material uh, into garbage. Um, but you can say, well, I want to avoid throwing recyclable material um, into the garbage. Um, sometimes, for example, um, throwing uh, something onto the ground or driving at a particular in a particular way, um, we wouldn't say it's haram, but if it causes inconvenience um, or it may cause, for example, uh, harm um, potentially, then you want to try and um, avoid that. Um, there are many other things that will come up in your day-to-day -day life. Um, yes, thank you. Um, you know, overeating as well is, is not um, haram. You can overeat. Um, but then that doesn't mean that you want to overeat. You want to contain yourself. Extravagant eating is not haram, right, if you're able to afford it. Um, but that doesn't mean that you want to eat always extravagantly. Um, you've got five pairs of shoes, buying the sixth one isn't haram, right? But your conscience tells you that that money could go and help somebody. I already have five pairs of shoes. Um, then maybe that's something that, you know, you want to avoid. Um, um, watching a lot of TV, for example, um, is not haram. I guess if you have the time and you're watching something that's appropriate, um, but then you also realize that you are wasting a lot of productive time that you could give towards community service, um, then you want to avoid that, um, even though there's no fatwa that says watching more than three hours of TV a day is haram, for example. Um, so, you know, uh, and thank you for those examples. Um, these are some examples of things that, whilst they may not be haram, um, when you think about your own life and what you could do for your society, um, your conscience tells you that, you know, this is not the right way of living life, um, then you want to start avoiding those things. But thank you again for that question. I think that's, uh, that's an important question. All right, coming to the conclusion, um, we say it, and I, and I hope this is the most important takeaway um, from our sessions. Um, whenever we thought of morality, we thought of actions, uh, moral actions, moral etiquettes, moral behavior. Um, but we say that morality is not an action, it is a state. And all the moral actions are supposed to build that state. Morality is a state of the soul. It's a character. It's not just a behavior. Secondly, we say that there are much higher standards of morality that we need to develop and we need to work on them. And morality is not just limited to not harming others. Yes. Sometimes we say that, well, as long as I'm not harming anybody else, I am a good person. Uh, being a good person in Islam is more than just not harming others, even though that's a, a part of it. Um, thirdly, we also saw that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given human beings a moral compass. Um, and that moral compass is the fitrah. And that's um, uh, the conscience that a human being has. And Allah says in the Quran, we have given this to you so that you would use it and the role of religion is first and foremost to revive that moral compass so that we act on the basis of our conscience, right? We act on the basis of that which we know to be right and stay away from those things that we know to be wrong. Um, then we say that the role of religion in general is not only to revive that moral compass, but to nurture moral development within us. And I hope that by the end of today's session, you've seen that nurturing moral development um, is, is not a simple task. Um, we say today, first, you have to do, remove the negative morals, uh, negative character traits, and then develop the positive ones. 
number one. Um, we also say that we have to move from just good character traits to some of the best character traits, the most noble character traits. We also say that we have to look at our intention for those character traits and make them purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, fourthly, we say that we have to turn that from behavior into character. Um, so, you know, all of these things, religion not only urges us to do that, but we refer to the Qur'an and the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt to actually show us a path of how to achieve that. And I don't think that there is any philosophy in the secular world, or for that matter, any other religion um, that will teach you how to achieve that the way the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt wasalam, teach us how to do that. Um, and finally, the purpose of Islamic laws is not to limit human moral agency. It just defines the boundaries that a human being should not cross. And with that, um, we're going to end our session and our course. Um, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us the tawfiq to um, understand our duties, to reflect upon the teachings of the Qur'an, and to build our commitment, insha'Allah, towards becoming a moral person. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq to be in his obedience and to refrain from the acts of disobedience. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us tawfiq to develop makarim al-akhlaq and to make it a part of our character. And most importantly, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our souls in a way that would please him. Wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm going to be here for a couple of minutes um, in case you have any other questions um, that you'd like to ask at this time. And then inshallah we will end the session. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.